Welcome to New Scientist TV. This month we take a look at a robot that could be creating art. We also attend a wedding that doubled as a science experiment. But first we investigate whether a balloon-like habitat is really fit to house humans in space. Here in Las Vegas, a company called Bigelow Aerospace is developing habitats that could soon be snapped up for research in space. Unlike existing spacecraft, the modules will expand to their full size once they're in orbit. Two prototypes have already been launched and now they're being scaled up. What's being worked on right now in Las Vegas is the Sundancer and this is this first model you see here. Uh, we will launch the Sundancer first, deploy it, test it out, and then the next launch will be these two pieces, which is a combined node and propulsion bus. The node serves the same purpose as the Unity node and the ISS and allows for additional docking of spacecraft and modules. These space stations are a lot more spacious than existing spacecraft. Two modules will provide more room than the whole International Space Station. Since they only reach their full volume in space, they should be easier to launch too. I think the best analogy is to compare it to almost a tent-like technology where it can be compacted in rocket fairings so it's very small and then hitting orbit it will be deployed. The length always remains the same but the diameter increases dramatically. You can think of it as going from a pencil to a Coke can after expansion. The idea seems practical but is it safe to live in a fabric spacecraft? According to Gold, his shell is a better option than one made of metal. We have done side-by-side -side testing where we take uh, our micrometeorite orbital debris layer and our Kevlar-like system and test it directly next to ISS outer shell. And ballistics will actually go through the ISS outer layer and stop about midway through ours. Think of it as a bulletproof vest in space that also gives you good protection from radiation. Gold and his team are confident that their stations will hold up in space, but they still need to develop capsules that will transport people to and from the spacecraft. Luckily, a recent grant will help them do just that. The Bigel Aerospace Boeing team has received an award from NASA to begin work on a commercial crew capsule, and our hopes is that by later in the year, uh, we will receive the green light to proceed with a full-on program, leading to actual hardware in about three to four years. With President Obama's recent decision to rely more on commercial companies for space travel, Bigelow now looks perfectly poised to stake its claim in orbit. Creativity and art are always seen as uniquely human, but next up we take a look at a sketching robot that's challenging those assumptions. James Urquhart tells us more. Here at Connecticut Art Fair in London, a computer is mimicking the way one artist sketches. The system is based on the drawing style of one of the team members, Patrick Tresse. It sketches a face detected by a webcam or from an uploaded picture. It segments out the face, which means that it, it uh, picks up the face from the background. Then after, it's slicing the, the image with different grey levels and uses that as a, each one as a kind of map. Using artificial intelligence, the program copies the steps that Tresse thinks he goes through when he draws. But the team isn't just trying to recreate his style of drawing. The main motivation, original motivation, and still the motivation, is to get an understanding of what, it, what is the creative act, what happens in your mind, what kind of strategies are uh, put down. Initially we had some idea of what this might be, and this is the system that we have now. The current system produces a drawing in one shot. The next step is to make it modify its sketch as it draws, just like a human would. But the team also plans to experiment with different robotic arms. What we're looking at now is actually cheaper robots and, in a sense, not perfectly engineered robots. If you do the same task twice, you'll have a little bit of differences. And that, that's actually good for us because that's giving us a um, artificial system that's a bit closer to how the, the, the human uh, in its creative act uh, behaves. Research in visual perception is also influencing their model. This study has been tracking people's gaze and hand position as they draw a self-portrait to compare strategies used by artists and non-artists. When we study a proficient 
draftman and a novice one. There's huge differences in the strategies used and how we look, the frequency the, and the fixation length. The team hopes that by tweaking the software, the fundamental components of creativity will eventually be revealed. But can human creativity be programmed into a machine? And if that's possible, is the result really art? By focusing on the dynamics of drawing, they're sure to challenge one of the most cherished human abilities. Finally, we found out why a new scientist reporter included blood sampling in her wedding ceremony. Sandrine Kerstemont takes up the story. Most people plan to make their wedding special, but this wedding in southern England was a first for science. Nick and Linda invited researcher Paul Zak to take blood samples from them and their guests. It was a chance to find out what goes on in people's bodies during this momentous bonding event. The value of doing this as a field study is that we have an actual real-life event. So this way we actually go in in a very natural setting, a wedding with 100 people, some of which knew each other and some of which didn't know each other. Thirteen people, including the bride and groom, had their blood drawn before and after the couple took their vows. Zach wanted to find out if there would be a rise in their oxytocin, a hormone associated with love, trust and bonding. We thought maybe during this wedding ceremony, people are bonding to each other and they're actually releasing oxytocin. So we measured oxytocin and we also measured a bunch of other hormones that were also associated with reproduction. Zach found that the couple and close family members had more extreme changes in oxytocin. Linda had the biggest spike in oxytocin, 28% increase in oxytocin before and after her vows. So she's really feeling the love. Who's next? The bride's mother. Of course the bride's mother is very engaged emotionally. And then the groom's father. And then the groom. And then further out are some just random friends that we pulled. Testosterone is linked to sex drive and studies have found that it drops when men fall in love. Zach expected this to happen at the wedding too, but results proved otherwise. We also found that testosterone levels were flat for all the men who we tested, except for the groom. So immediately after the vows, his testosterone levels doubled from beforehand. Why is that? He had this beautiful woman wearing a gorgeous strapless gown and he's thinking about the honeymoon. According to Zach, the most important finding was that just being part of a wedding makes us release oxytocin. This may help explain why most people choose to have a wedding instead of eloping with their partner. I think the ritual evolved because we all have a stake in sustaining the human race. Bride and groom they have a built-in set of people who are emotionally engaged with them, who care about the outcome. That's all for now, but there are lots more videos on our website. See how tiny helicopters could be used in a new 3D display system and find out why termite mounds are inspiring architects. See you next time.